What is the Schomburg Center? To me, it is home. The place where we come to see who we really are, not just somebody else's reflection of who we are. The Schomburg Center is a place of culture, it's a place of history, it's a place of knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is a repository of all of the things that has documented our sense of worth as a people. For me, that means that it is a place of immense power. The Schomburg Center is a public research library and a cultural institution. For the study of the Pan-African world, it is perhaps the best in the world. My Schomburg Center is Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg said, Black history and culture and intellect exists at a time when most people didn't believe that. He collected those evidences, and that became the beginning of the collection. And it has expanded and has grown to where it is now a world-class institution. It holds over 10 million items. There's no parallel anywhere that brings to light what we as people of color have done, what we continue to do. Black culture is all of culture. The universals that animate everyone's life happen here. For all people. The Schomburg for me is one of the center pillars of Harlem. When I started the journey of finding out about Red Rooster and Harlem, the very first place I went to was the Schomburg. Researchers from around the world come and use what we have here. I could not have written just about any of the books that I've written without the Schomburg Center's archives, resources. The Schomburg Center is much more than a library. We encourage lifelong learning and exploration. The Junior Scholars Program is a Saturday program with students from fifth grade to senior year in high school to help them learn about black history and culture. Learning about my history is important because it teaches me who I am. The Schomburg Junior Scholars Program is going to do nothing but uplift them. So many talented and brilliant people have walked the corridors of this amazing institution over the years. From Octavia Butler to Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, Ella Fitzgerald, Alvin Ailey, and Harry Belafonte, who graced the stage in this room of the American Negro Theater. This place evokes great memories. It was a gift to us in our community to really try to find that space to reflect expressions of black experience. I just knew that the environment, what I saw these young African Americans doing, was a place I needed to be. What is my Schomburg Center? I'm standing here at the Cosmogram, which underneath holds the ashes of the poet Langston Hughes. On the evening when this cosmogram was dedicated, people began to empty out of the auditorium. A jazz trio struck up, and to my amazement, Amira Baraka went over and asked Maya Angelou for a dance. And they started to dance on top of the cosmogram, on top of the ashes of Langston Hughes. And I felt what a fitting way to kiss the memory of Langston. The Schomburg Center is a research institute and a library, but it's so much more than that. There's something going on every day. So many amazing people come here to talk about their creative craft, to share what inspires them. The Schomburg Center's collections help to tell stories even beyond our walls. The Schomburg Center is here in this exhibition at MoMA, One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. We depend on the resources of the Schomburg to enable us to tell this story. Thinking about the implications of the past on the present is absolutely crucial for understanding the next steps, understanding what we have to do to go forward. We today have the responsibility of making sure that new artists and activists, new scholars and poets know that this place continues to be a resource and a source of inspiration for the work that we must continue to do. The Schomburg Center is knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is education. The Schomburg Center is home. It is family. It is foundational. The Schomburg Center is inspiration. The Schomburg is with me in everything that I do. Community, inside and out. The Schomburg Center is us. The Schomburg Center is you. And we invite each and every one of you to find your Schomburg Center.
Good evening. I know many of you all have been here many, many times, but no matter how many times you see that video, it is always affecting um, to say, you know, I hear folks gasp at certain things and laugh at certain things, and I'm like, I know you all have been here quite a bit, and yet it's always the same, and we feel the same way too. My name is Novella Ford. I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions here at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Thank you for joining us in Harlem, as well as those who are watching online, online for tonight's preview of Freedom on the Move, Songs in Flight a song cycle commissioned and conceived by Sparks and Wiry Cries founders, Martha Guth and Erica Switzer with composer Sean Opeblo. Songs in Flight is described as seeking to bring awareness to the creativity made possible through the Freedom on the Move database, building a living monument to this history by highlighting stories of strength rather than stories of oppression. And we'll come back to this idea of building a living monument when we get into our discussion. The Song Cycle will have its premiere at the Metropolitan Museum of Art this Thursday. How many people in this room have tickets to that already? Excellent, because it's sold out. So the rest of you all, this preview is it until um, it shows up online. Uh, but with that said, I'm going to ask you all to silence your cell phones. And we are live streaming tonight's conversation as well as performances. But tonight will be the only night that we'll live stream it, and then we'll put it up a little later after it's had its um, run around the country. So if you want to share this tonight's program with others right now, if they want to watch it live, they could find it at youtube.com forward slash the Schomburg Center. That's youtube.com forward slash the Schomburg Center, all one word. Now, we may have some more people joining us in the auditorium, so I am going to ask that if you have spread out a little bit into seats near and around you that you sort of consolidate a little bit so that when people come in, if there's a performance or something like that, that we don't have to do too much maneuvering. We're also going to ask that, sure, you can take a few photos, but no professional photography as well as no video recording. We understand sometimes you want to take a little clip for the, for the gram or for social media, but not more than that. Um, our, our security will come around if it seems that the recording is taking longer than a short moment. Can we all be in agreement around that? Thank you so much. <laughs> so as you entered the Langston Hughes Auditorium, you were welcomed by excerpts from unsung, unheralded narratives of American slavery and abolition, which is this book that was published, uh, I want to say, well, wow, 2021. Uh, is when this came out, and it is the first in a series of upcoming anthologies from the Schomburg Center, published in partnership with Ping and Cla Classics. It was edited by Dr. Michelle Commander, who is our Deputy Director of Research and Strategic Initiatives. With archival material culled from Arturo Schomburg's seed collection, the Lapidus Center for Historical Analysis of Transatlantic Slavery here at the Schomburg Center, as well as the Schomburg's collections. Included in that presentation that was on the screen was Nuri Hazard, who was reading Lost Friends advertisements from the Southwestern Christian Advocate from the 1880s and 90s. It was in the aftermath of emancipation and families seeking the whereabouts of loved ones who were scattered across the country. Next was an audio recording of a story written by a hairdresser who recounts the reunion of a mother and daughter 35 years in the making. It was set in the streets of New Orleans circa 1859. The mother was still an enslaved woman, while the daughter lived free and uh, had some means. And then there was a scene from William Wells Brown, an abolitionist and playwright, who was born into slavery and escaped. And in his 1858 play, The Escape or A Leap of Freedom, produced by National Black Theater for our program back in 2021, it showed the tale of a couple who married secretly planning to escape in order for their union to survive the drudgery and violence of slavery, reminding us that there was a sweetness worth holding on to and for dying for. It is through this frame of black love, liberation, and sovereignty that we will move between tonight's performances and conversations. We are joined by composer Sean Opeblo, poet and Duke University professor Dr. Titsi Ella Jaji, who was also a Schomburg Scholar and resident in 2015, 2016. We're also joined by Grammy and MacArthur Award-winning musician, Rhiannon Giddens, soprano, Karen Slack, 
countertenor Reginald Mobley, baritone Will Liverman, pianist Howard Watkins, and Dr. Edward Baptist, who's the co-lead of the Freedom on the Move database and historian at Cornell University. So first, we're going to begin the evening with a performance by Rianne Giddens, and then we'll get into some more conversation and performance. Thank you all for joining us. Good evening. It's lovely to be here on occasion of this fantastic project. Um, and I know it's been in the works for um, some time, and it's been absolutely thrilling to be a part of it. Usually, I'm the only um, crazy person who likes to talk about um, advertisements from the 1800s. Um, so it feels good to be part of a cohort for once. Um, because these are important things. And they're important not just because, um, not just because of the history books, but because of what they tell us about us and because of what we don't have when you're looking to make art and create things from the history of African Americans. Often what you have is ephemera, um, pieces of things, snippets of things, often made by enslavers. It gets really complicated and you have to figure out how to make something that is touching a larger piece of humanity from such a small scrap and it's something that I've been doing in my work with the gratitude to the academics who've tracked those scraps down, who've looked at the microfiche to, to find these advertisements, to measure the instruments, to make the replicas. This is a replica from um, around 1858. So that composers and musicians and writers and singers can come along and try to make sense out of it. This is a song um, that I wrote years before this project um, when I saw an advertisement that had been published in a paper in 1798, I think. Um, and I saw a digital replica of that advertisement on the computer. Um, and uh, it really struck me. I hadn't really thought about the horribleness of uh, advertisements for human beings uh, in, in the same way until I saw this particular ad, which was for a young woman who was for sale. For not, not for any reason, but for want of employ, it says, and she has with her a nine-month-old baby who was at the purchaser's option. And it was the last line that kind of became the keystone for me thinking about the quotidian nature of evil, that someone composed that ad, somebody typeset that ad, and then how many scores and hundreds of people read that ad and didn't think anything of it. Didn't think anything of it. She has with her a nine-month-old baby who is at the purchaser's option. So what I did is instead of thinking about those folks I thought about her, that young woman, and, and this is, I think, what we can gain from these kinds of explorations is the focus on how do we retain our humanity through these inhuman things and through these inhuman times and how do people retain their humanity even now because it's not like it's over. It's not like it doesn't happen anymore. Um, so this is a song focusing on this young woman's ability to choose to get up in the morning within this reality of this advertisement. It's called At the Purchaser's Option. Baby 
place it right there. Yeah. Hello, hello, oh, hello. Thank you so much for opening us up, Rhiannon. That was amazing. I've been listening to Freedom's Highway. Is that the name of the album that that's originally on? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's such a great way for us to start because it really sort of sets up this idea of building a living monument to history. And I think you were talking a little bit about that. Um, could you say a little bit more about, first, sort of how did you come to the banjo, for those who don't know, um, a little bit of your background, and then we'll get into the whole cycle, Sean. Um, yeah, it always, it's a great opportunity. I, I try to use, that banjo speaks. Um, it's an African-American instrument um, and has become an emblem of the story of America for me when I found out at 23 or four or whatever, when I found out that, let alone, was, it wasn't an invention of white mountaineers, it had this whole other history of being created by the African diaspora in the Caribbean and then becoming a, the actual emblem of black life for you know years and years and years before it ever you know became part of our consciousness with, you know, the, the Beverly Hillbillies or right. whatever, or Deliverance or whatever. And that there, and it represents so much. So when I found that replica um, mm -hmm. by a wonderful instrument maker from upstate New York, that is for me the crossroads of so much of American culture because mm -hmm. that is the moment where the banjo, it used to, they were all made of, you know, like gourds or calabashes, they were handmade instruments, they were spiritual instruments, they were used for all these different, you know, things within black life, and then that's the first commercial model wow. that white folks start to play. Mm -hmm. So it still has the, the, sp the, the, the sound, mm -hmm. you know, because I have a gourd banjo, and it's beautiful, but I can't travel with it, right. you know? Right. There's a reason why it was a commercial. It was mm -hmm. made, you know, so that's that, that hoop construction, which comes from, that's a whole long, another story. Um, so it allowed it to be used in a performance setting and, and to be mass produced and all of this sort of thing and actually probably made it the instrument, you know, it would probably be at like the diddly bow if it hadn't made that transition, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there's, it's always this kind of coming together of like African and European mm -hmm. models, you know, of everything from the music to construction and everything. And that to me is like, that's the moment where it still has a lot of the Africanness of it with the sound, mm -hmm. but it's got European innovation that then changes. And then once it goes off on that track, I'm, right. I'm, I'm good. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. It's, it's fine, I play that banjo a lot. <laughs> anyway, and that's not really answering your question, but I just think I always like to take the opportunity yeah. to mention that because it's something that we don't know and it's emblematic of the, the issues of what we don't know about our culture. For me, it's like, mm -hmm. it's a great emblem of that because what you think is white is actually the opposite yeah. and vice versa, you know, right. which is fascinating to me. So anyway, that's why yeah. the banjo. Well, thank you. And I feel like that really sets up this song cycle, right? Because there are a lot of musical genres that is happening inside of this song cycle. So I'm curious, take us from the very beginning. How did you get involved with this particular project and why these styles, why these people as part of this project? Well, thank you. First of all, I'm glad to, to be here. This is really special. Um, well, Martha Goose, um, um, uh, who um, is a director, one of the directors of Sparks and Harry Cry, she, she contacted me and she says, you know, I have this idea. Um, and she explained the idea, the freedom of the move, the, you know, the database. And I want you to, you know, I want to commission you to write a song cycle. I had to think about it, though, mm -hmm. because I had just finished uh, a heavy <clears throat> piece um, about the uh, 1963 church bombing in, in Birmingham and, and the 2015 shooting in Charleston. And then I had just finished another piece of nine Langston Hughes poems that dealt with black pain. So I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. You know, this is kind of traumatic, you know? Um, um, but I, I read more about, about the database. Um, she told me the collaborators. I said, you know what, mm. I have to do this. this. This is my, my, my voice. I mean, mm -hmm. um, to have this database presented in such a different way so that our history can be told, um, I, I, I just, you know, I, I just jumped on it. Um, and I love writing song. Art song to me is just so fun because uh, it's very collaborative. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, and I like people. <laughs> um, and so I get to work with poets. Uh, um, and working with Titi, and, and she not only has several poems in this song cycle, she curated the, uh, the whole project and added two other poets. Um, and to really dig down and look at these poems in such a different way, they're all different poems, different poets. Um, and to really engage the poetry in that art form in such a unique way is, is very rewarding. Um, and it, it made the whole project just, uh, in many ways, a dream, even though it was difficult to write. This is, this is hard stuff to write. And, um, um, and because the poems are so different, they came from different places, that allowed for um, uh, the music to speak differently. Mm -hmm. um, we also have different types of singers. Um, um, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about opera versus folk singers versus transitional singers. Even within the opera genre, we have three very different singers, right. and, um, which, which also helps in terms of um, different styles uh, of, of writing. Mm. Now, I, I got ahead of myself. Let me make sure that everybody knows who's on the stage. Okay. We have Sean O'Peblo, who is our composer. We've met Rihanna Giddens. We have Dr. Titsi Jaji, who is professor, associate professor at Duke University, as well as a poet. And I mentioned she was also a scholar in residence here at the Schomburg Center. We have Dr. Edward Baptist, who is a co-lead uh, on Freedom on the Move database. And we have Reginald Mobley. Mobley, who is an incredible singer, and we will get to know them more as we go through this process. So I'm going to talk to you, Dr. Baptist. Could you tell us a little bit about this Freedom on the Move database? How did it come together, and how did you get involved in this project? Sure. Well, the database was, in a lot of ways, not really a new idea. Historians have known about these ads and have used these ads for a long time, and different historians have collected them and published books with 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 of them. Um, Lath and Windley, who taught at Morgan State for years. Um, John Hope Franklin, who taught at Duke for years, um, published a book about them. Um, but most of the ads lived on the shelves of libraries, if, if you will, and, and it was hard to get access to them. And so a group of historians, uh, myself, um, Josh Rothman of Alabama, Molly Mitchell of University of New Orleans, um, Vanessa Holden of, of University of Kentucky and Hassan Jeffries at o, uh, Ohio State University said, maybe we can use the, um, the power and the accessibility of, of the internet to try again to create a database that has all of the ads in one place. We've got about 33,000 in there now, including thousands that, that came from earlier collections, like that of um, Winley, with, which his um, widow has generously shared with us. And so um, we're not really doing something new, in a sense. Um, we're doing something that, that um, builds on the work of others and ultimately builds on um, what uh, freedom seekers did because they wrote themselves uh, into the, the, um, the records of, of this system which was designed um, to police them and, and keep them in slavery, uh, but which they, through their courage, resisted and, and, and um, created this living record which includes um, many bios of them. Now, we were going along um, uh, building K through 12 educational resources, um, trying to expand the kind of scholarly reach of it, um, trying to uh, make the, the database uh, more accessible and useful for public history and, and community history. When out of the blue, uh, I, I get a message from uh, uh, Martha Guth and, and Lucy Fitzgibbon um, who they, they told me about this idea that, that you all had to, to create the, um, uh, the song cycle. And, and as I, I said the other day, my first question was, what's a song cycle? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, I did know the names of, of, of some of the artists who were already associated with, with the project. Uh, and, and that was very exciting. And, and so um, I've, I've just been very blessed, not just to be here in, in this space, which is an, an honor, but um, to be um, over here to the, the, the side, um, playing my own um, particular role in, in the project, um, watching something that's, that's really astounding and amazing develop. And what, and what did you learn? What is a song cycle? Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> there might be people out here who don't know. I don't know either, so this is going to be my next question. 
Oh, so so I'm supposed no. to. No, yeah, Sean. Let's, let's have Sean. <laughs> Dude. Well, let's start, let's start with an art song. An art song is simply um, uh, a song uh, set to poetry, um, either pre-existing poetry or poetry written specifically for uh, the, uh, the song. A song cycle is a collection of these songs. Um, sometimes, um, well, oftentimes there's, there's a common theme. Mm -hmm. um, um, a lot of times you can, you know, take a song from a song cycle and perform them just, you know, on its own. Sometimes some song cycles you need to perform them all together because there's a, a very clear uh, a narrative arc. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so just a, a simple, a, 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 a simple definition is just a poem a set to music and a collection of poems uh, set to lots of music. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think, uh, you know, when you think of art song and song cycle, it's often been used exclusively in the classical realm. Yeah, yeah. Right. The idea of there being a, a singer and a pianist, there's no amplification, and mm -hmm. it's using training that is meant to fill the space without um, being amplified. But one of the things I know that Martha and Sparks and Wired Cries, what they're trying to do is to, is to push on what is the definition of, mm -hmm. of an art song and a song cycle. Is a spiritual song in a church, is that an art song? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's poetry. Yeah. So yep. it's just like the, the idea of you know this, this, the voice styles, how it's being presented, how all of those things are, are really up for grabs because it's a powerful art form that kind of gets eclipsed by opera mm -hmm. in the classical yeah. world. Mm -hmm. But it really creates a relationship between the performer and the audience because it requires intense listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, which is something that we're not that good at anymore. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> given, given the Instagrams and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. So right. it's, it's a great, I think it's a, it's a great thing to focus yeah. on because we, we need that. We need that connection, you know, yeah. more than ever. Thank you for that. Sorry to. No, no, thank you. No, really, really the idea of expanding what an art song is. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's, yeah, so thank you for that. On the homepage of um, the Freedom on the Move database, it reads, Rediscovering the Stories of Self-Liberating People, a database of, fugitive, of fugitives from American slavery. And I appreciate it seeing sort of that terminology, self-liberating. Um, Dr. Kelly Carter Jackson talks about how black people were their first abolitionists, right? They, they knew how terrible slavery was. And so <laughs> to the extent that they could and that they would, they would absolutely try to get out of it and escape. Um, and so I'm curious about how Sean and, and Dr. Jaji, if you could talk about how do you go to this database and how do you, what is the spiritual work that you really have to do in order to be in the database and then pull these stories out and then create song or then think about poetry that you may have already written or, or words out there, if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, I also just have to join Sean in saying it's such a blessing to be here with all of you and um, in, this, in the spirit of this space. Um, and in a way, I think that's what carries us through any of these kinds of projects, right? Mm -hmm. Is that there is a cloud of witnesses mm -hmm. that is coming with us and that has pulled mm -hmm. us here. Um, uh, the first poem that I wrote, and it's the, it's the second poem in the cycle, um, but the first one that was sort of composed specifically for this project is, is about going to the database and really struggling with what that was. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked myself, number one, I, I sent it late to Sean because it took me a long time to work myself up to being in it because you don't mm -hmm. want to sit with what I didn't want to <laughs> sit with <laughs> was um, here I am choosing right. a person right. from a collection of people. Right. It, the rhyme with an auction block was very unsettling. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was like, you know what? You've got to do it. <laughs> you know, like Sean's waiting, Martha's <laughs> there. Um, and uh, so I searched for woman because what the database has done is set up all these um, metadata tags um, and you could access it under many, many different categories. If you wanted to find someone who knew how to bake or mm -hmm. spoke French or what have you. Um, so I just put woman and I said, I'm gonna go with the first one that comes. And that was Phoebe, mm -hmm. who is um, the Phoebe in the first song. And, and the poem is about not wanting to work on it, about having to figure out the, um, the newspaper print 
right, which is the everyday, which is the, the authoritative, now we know what happened. What does it say? It's like literally blurry, and mm -hmm. they, they scan them all in, so you have this encounter with the materiality of that. Um, but it's the story of somebody who regarded Phoebe as a property mm -hmm. also knew how Phoebe wore her hair, right, very yeah. specific. the yeah. kinds of combs she liked, mm -hmm. which cheek she had a scar on. Mm -hmm. So they know. Mm -hmm. And yet they sustain this like mm -hmm. incoherence. And so there's also this knowledge that whatever we come up with will have been insufficient mm -hmm. to have undone history. Right but that we can lay our hands on mm -hmm. the life of Phoebe, of her imagination. Mm -hmm. of, um, and, and that seemed more important than being scared of right. this project. And I think that's where I do feel like um, Art song is a perfect way to do that because it's also a very intimate form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's just one pianist and just one singer in the room, mm -hmm. right? In this case, more. Um, and there's a particular kind of relationship between a poet and a composer. And I'm so grateful to Sean because we had many times where we would just talk on the phone for an mm -hmm. hour about like a phrase and where it's coming from and how it's resonating for us and hitting us mm -hmm. so that we could carry each other. Mm -hmm. And coming this week is the first time um, we've all been together, and to hear mm -hmm. what has come through for everybody and each other's stories right. of what's been hard mm -hmm. does feel like spiritual work and very important work, and it's mm -hmm. a privilege to be part of that. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that hard work, yeah. right? Because you do resurrect these people in a whole other way. It is a reclaiming of the, these pieces, mm -hmm. right, from these ads um, that we only think of as being exploitative, but really they tell us something about these people. And so what happens when you sort of turn that on its head? And I feel like that's what you're doing with this song cycle. And I saw you sort of responding to her talking about yeah. that first piece. Say more. Yeah, well, first of all, she's a brilliant poet. <laughs> um, and I've said this before in interviews that, um, you know, uh, people ask me, so, so you know, do you have the melody in your, in your head, the harmony, do you have you know, the rhythm, the motive? I said, no. Mm -hmm. I can't write a single note mm -hmm. until I feel like I have you know, the poetry in me somehow. Mm -hmm. and, and that means read the poem out loud, look in the mirror and read the poem. Mm -hmm. you know, if the poet is dead, read commentary about the poem. Mm -hmm. If the poem is a, poet is alive, I'm like, Cece, can you just like record yourself reading the poem mm -hmm. several different ways? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, this line here, th this is what I think it means. What do you, what do you think it means? You know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and when I feel like I have the poem like somewhat in me, yeah. and then it sounds totally cliche, that's when the music is right. Mm -hmm. um, um, and and, I, and I've, there's been pieces that I've struggled to write because I, and I realized I'm, I'm not connecting with the poem. Yeah. You know, but, uh, but with this cycle, um, uh, it, 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 you know, I sat with the poetry for a long uh, time before I wrote a single note. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm just grateful for, for, for this whole experience. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Reggie, could you talk a little bit about performing this work? I know it's going to get performed in its whole, in entirety, in th on Thursday. And yesterday was really kind of the first time mm -hmm. all of you all coming together. And you're, you have a particular speciality. And I feel like this might sit outside of that, yet you are telling these stories, yet you're doing something very similar um, inside of the work that you do. So talk a little bit about embodying these words alongside the work that you do. Well, it's always a bit of a journey. Um, when you create something for the first time, like this, when everyone comes together. In, in my typical day job, my, my Clark Kent time is spent uh, <laughs> behind, behind notes that were th torn on the, you know, thrown on the page hundreds of years ago. I'm, I'm recreating and reinterpreting someone else's work, but to be a part of that creative process is, is so thrilling because we know exactly what the intent was from the poets, from the composers, from everyone involved, because what the singer does is truly what we must be is, is, is 
the least important person in the room. We're the servant to all of this. Mm -hmm. We open ourselves up to being <laughs> basically intercessors and being that access panel to connect the soul of the work that was created here to everyone that's there. We're just the center point, kind of the prism that allows everyone who's coming in for the first time to hear this music to instantly have a connection to what to what they've written, what they've what they've set, which is all, which is further connected to the people, to the lives, the souls behind this music that was that was created, mm -hmm. and it's and it's and it's basically what we do. I mean, before the banjo, before the harp and the violin, there was song, there was mm -hmm. there was singing, there was, there, you know, we were creating, and singing spirituals at the same time as Bach and Handel were writing. This mm -hmm. is, this is you know, I'm an early musician, and this is just a connection to early music as a black person, as an American. And so what we try to do, our point for after everything that we do through the song cycle is to allow ourselves to be possessed by these people mm -hmm. that, that inspired these, these stories, these posters, and to present them here for you to see this is the source of our resilience as black people. This is where we come from. This is a strong line of, of power, not sorrow, not grief, mm. but of survival. You know, if you live, you win. And so mm. that's kind of what we hope to do. The, 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 well, with Rhiannon, the four, the four of us presenting that, and, and Howard, the five of us, actually, mm -hmm. yeah. um, to, be that, to be that face forward to connect you to the truth that we're hoping to share with everyone. Yeah. Please add to that, but let me just let me just pause at something that you said and give it a little snap and a clap mm -hmm. on it. Because yes, if we live, we win, mm -hmm. and I think that, that that just like hit me so hard the way that we that so much is about living, that the idea that we are still here is so powerful. I just want to say a really quick thing. So I wrote this thing right, and I heard it on MIDI, which is like a computerized version. I I didn't know how this piece sounded until this morning. Mm. Um, they brought it to life yeah. in, the, in the most beautiful way. It's, uh, I'll, I'll hear Rhiannon sing and bring, up, uh, bring several movements t tomorrow for the first time. And it's going to be a, a new experience. I, I'm, I'm experiencing these songs at the same time as you are, pretty much. <laughs> and it's amazing. Like, uh, when I heard Reggie sing, for example, his, his song, um, it, 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 it was transcendent, you know, because it, it was his interpretation of what we were been working on for a long time. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, it's quite a magical thing that even though I've been composing for a long time, it's like it doesn't get old. Like it's a yeah. new thing. I'm still like shocked and surprised that this actually happened. <laughs> you know? there's, a, there's a reason why they, the, the first time that a singer sings a role that's been written, it's, it, it, it's on Broadway or for opera, they've created the role, mm. oh, yeah. right? And there, that's the reason. Because it doesn't, it's not, it's, it's not in 3D, it's only 2D until <laughs> right. the singer, right? right. It's right. like, it's that extra dimension. It's that Frankenstein yeah. monster. You know, these, <laughs> these parts on a, on a table, yeah. but then that spark of lightning comes in and, you, mm -hmm. and you, yeah. we've all created life. It's, yeah. it's, mm -hmm. it's incredible. Well, but, we, oh, sorry, I think also that I grew up in Zimbabwe and it's one of many places where the understanding that as the medium, you are the holy vessel, mm -hmm. you know, and so thank you for, for letting us notice that and the way that you, I mean, art song in the hands of these artists is like, it's an entirely different genre because Reggie can do the Bach. He can shift from the Bach to the Marvin Gaye. He can take you to church and be making it true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It looks effortless. It's years of devotion. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, I think this is a, this is part of a renaissance within classical music mm -hmm. that African American composers are bringing to it because it is coming from it is being drawn from cultural and lived experiences mm -hmm. in a way that a lot of classical music is not because all of the canon when those folks wrote that they were writing from a very specific cultural standpoint that was understood by the audience in a very particular way. Yeah. That's no longer there. Mm -hmm. So it's a different beast altogether. And it's not that we should stop playing Mozart and Bach because I like Mozart and Bach, but it's like, you know, we have, I'm just 
talking right now off my butt because it's just occurring to me that that's one of the reasons why this has got such an amazing energy, yeah. what's happening in classical music right now, because we've needed that. I mean, it's not like we haven't had it, like, you know, we had Aaron Copeland writing right. from a very Amer uniquely, you know, American experience, but we've needed this piece for, for a long time, and I think it's, it's this, is ju this is just part, this is part of it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, sorry, just occurred to me. Well, we're gonna be able to hear a little bit we're going to hear In Flight, which is being performed by Karen Slack, along with Will Liverman, and accompanied by Howard Watkins on piano. So Dr. Dajani, if you could set us up. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. In, in some ways, it, it, this is the song that I was saying um, really speaks to how difficult the process was. One of the choices that Sean and the um, uh, uh, producer, I, I'm not sure what her official title is, Camille. Um, director. Yeah, director did, was to decide how do we bring the actual text of the uh, advertisement into it. And so Sean uh, set parts of this where the other singers will read or um, speak part of the actual language of the ad and the contrast between that and mm -hmm. um, us in this moment, I think, is one of the beautiful things in this. Um, and uh, um, more than once, uh, we've talked about being weary of talking about that pain. But when I hear Karen sing this song, um, it's, it's life and it's joy. And it's like this expansiveness and possibility. And yes, if we sit with the pain, we have to sit with the pain. But it's like breath. If, we, if you live, you win. You know, like, and this, this artfulness of breath is such a gift. Yeah. yeah. Karen Slack, Will Liverman, and Howard Watkins. Seventh instance, Phoebe, a black girl, about 23 years old, of rather over middling height, long hair, put up in combs, a seer on one cheek, a genteel looking servant, and usually dressed neatly. formerly belonged to the estate of Mrs. Bonato, deceased. She is harbored somewhere in the city. A reasonable reward will be paid for her apprehension. Apply at this office October 17th.
What were you feeling listening <laughs> to it? Like I said, this, this, this never gets old. To, to have, um, I, you know, I'm sure people who write books, um, you can write as much music as you want, you know, but it's nothing until people bring life to it. Um, um, and and, and to, to have these musicians um, spend so much time on this piece of art. Mm -hmm. And again, I keep saying bring life to it in her own ways. It's just so meaningful. Um, so I've probably heard her sing this now since this morning three times, and I'm hearing new things. And I wrote the piece. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it, it's just it's such a powerful, powerful thing. And, um, and I like that, you know, and, and she can talk about this. She keeps saying I. The, I the, this, this is autobiographical. You, you talk, you, you take over from sure. me. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, um, I was thinking about the, there are many eyes in this suite, and this was the eye of how, how am I going to format history? When I first came to this ad, in order to make myself read it and pay attention to it, I literally did. I tried out what font will make it look like I am typing out exactly the same ad. Do I make line breaks where it was probably just a printer's, you know, mechanical reason for doing that because I was trying to figure out how will I pay attention? How will I pay attention? Um, and who am I to take up space here except to be the any one of us who must pose the question, how are we going to format this history in our present? And I mean, that's the wonder of being able to make a database that everybody has access to that kind of, um, within all the many, many ways in which our first world context. But the eye matters to me here because, like I said, I'm from Zimbabwe. It's a place where there probably were very small numbers of people trafficked through the Portuguese East Africa, right? But it was not part of our history in the way that it's part of the U.S. or, or in the Americas or um, Nigeria. I'm Nigerian. <laughs> yeah. They took us. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we had this conversation because Phoebe means light um, in, in Greek, um, but it also, mm -hmm. it, it, I thought of all of the words that are light, that are names for women in Shona. And so that's the Rujeko, that's the Jekesai, that's the Chiedza. And Sean and I, when we were talking about it, I said, you know, I don't know, I, it, it, am I stepping too far into this? And he was like, no, that's you, that's you, keep it there. And for me, it matters because this is every single person in this room's history, right? It's not just black people's history right. or folks for whom these are their ancestors. Um, and so I think that's the, the, the privilege of being able to put an eye that's trying to be honest, mm -hmm. trying to be mm -hmm. honest, and trying to be with these other sides. <coughs> but, yeah. So I'm thinking about the word flight in the name of this piece, song, Songs of Flight also this particular song, In Flight, um, Freedom on the Move, this movement. So I would love to hear each of you think about and talk about sort of what flight means to you in the context of this song cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, I can hear the soaring voices, right? Like I felt that I was holding my breath while she was singing. Um, and then the mobility, as I mentioned, and then the aerodynamics and the myths that we carry um, some African American myths and African myths, for that matter, in literature related to you know the people who could fly, and it's also in Song of Solomon. So, if each of you could give me a sense of what are you thinking about this word flight in the context of this particular piece, I'll start with you, Reggie. Okay, um, I well, when I think of flight, I'm just honestly just thinking of of freedom, of of agency, mm -hmm. uh, the ability to be really whoever and whatever you want to be and being able to just ex honestly exist mm -hmm. uh, without anyone kind of really kind of shackling or holding you down, just really being able to, 
to move and as an asthmatic to breathe. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it all comes back to just thoughts and ideas and, and visions of air mm -hmm. and motion and, and just movement. Yeah. Well, I would, I would open by saying, in case she doesn't say it, but Rhiannon has a, a song uh, mm -hmm. about the people who could fly on, mm -hmm. on Freedom Highway, which is, um, which is amazing. I have to pull over to the side of the road sometimes mm -hmm. when it comes on because it is um, it's so powerful. But um, I think the what flight brought brought up to me when you asked the question was the linkage is uh, we read the ads and and sometimes we can see that they are um, uh, the, the the enslaver knows that they're trying to escape to a mother, to a father, to a city, you know, with Phoebe, maybe she's being sheltered in, in uh, New Orleans, I think it is. Um, but sometimes we can read the ad and it's a description of one person. Uh, and when I read those, sometimes um, I think about uh, the experience of, of fear, of, mm -hmm. of uh, loneliness, of, of risk, um, because people were literally taking their lives in, into their hands. They were, they were hunted. Uh, there were bounties on their head. But um, what Songs in Flight uh, reminds me, and, and I think this ties back to, to the point about the, the singer as the interpreter, and, is that people were running to somewhere. They were running to somebody. They were never running alone. They were supported by other people. Um, they were supported by people who they knew and supported by people who they did not know, but who were nonetheless um, supporting them. Uh, and, and so um, the, the flight is always to not just somewhere, but to somebody, even if they don't know who they're going to yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it's also a flight from more than just the enslaver. And um, so one thing I've thought about is, is what does it, feel like to fly and to be leaving behind many of the people who you love and who sustain you even in that world. And there's a way in which that seems like it makes, you're taking your own life into your own hands, but also um, the life of, of what you're leaving behind. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, because the, the, the ads give us the small segment of people. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I just, I think what a privilege to sit here on this stage and contemplate life for these people and to make art about it. The flight of the freedom that 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 is inherent in that contemplation, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to contemplate <laughs> difficulty rather than living it mm -hmm. right. is the gift that we all have sitting in this room. If you're sitting in this room, it's a gift. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, people ask me like, how do you go through? you know, doing something like at the purchaser's option, night after night after night after night. I was like, I didn't have to live it. Right. Mm. So what we're doing with this freedom is engaging with it. And I think that's really powerful. And, and it goes back to agency. When you fly, mm. it's, it's, it's the power of being able to remove yourself. And I, it goes back to the, the life, if you live, you win. Not always, actually. I've been sitting here thinking about that. And there were many instances where people flew over the side of a ship, or they flew knowing that they were going to die, but that the escape was more important than living in bondage. And that's agency. That was their decision. And I love it. It goes back to also the terminology of enslaver, of somebody self-emancipating, not escaping. And so, like, I think that's all flight. Mm -hmm. It's all flight, and we get to, like, you know, have a slice of that. Sorry, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I was going to say something similar, but I'll get into that in one second. But I just want to say, take this moment to say, it, um, as the composer, um, um, this, this, is, th that, this wasn't a, 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 a piece for soprano soloist with piano accompaniment. Mm -hmm. The piano, it's, it's, actually, it's chamber music for me. It's, it's, this was a duet. Um, sometimes there's quartets or trios. Um, uh, because the piano drives the narrative too. They're, they're, um, and I, I'm, I wanted to mention that because um, I tried to evoke the idea of flight even in the piano part in mm -hmm. several ways, in several ways, which I can talk about another time. Um, but um, the word flight um, to me is a is a, is a spiritual uh, thing. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that um, for the enslaved. Um, they weren't totally free in, until they died. Mm. There was their freedom, mm. you know? And so the idea of flying away to heaven, you know, um, it's just, that's just one, you know, I, you know idea of flight. It's, I, I agree with everyone on, on the stage, mm. but, but um, in, in some of these pieces, um, especially the, the first piece that Rhiannon is singing, um, it, it, it's, the, it's the idea that you know, you know, you're not truly free, truly free, um, and, 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 uh, 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 until we leave this earth. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, do you have that thinking through a religious lens, or is that really through sort of your musical? Well, 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 well both. So, you know, as, again, trying to, so I, I've done a lot of work with, um, Reimagining Negro spirituals, mm -hmm. okay. Some call it ranging. I call it reimagining Negro spirituals. Wow. And so, <laughs> and so, and so, what what I had to do is um, place myself, as far as I can, into the context. So, for example, um, he's got the whole world in his hands. That's something. If you're a church-going person, you learn that <laughs> as a three-year-old. He's got the whole world in his hands. You know, it's happy. But I'm like. How would a mother sing that to their child during the time of, of slavery? He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby. You know, to me, it's more slow, more of a, like, you know, reflective. Um, and so, to answer your question, that's kind of how I approach this. Like, mm -hmm. like, what is flight to them? Because many of the slaves, most of the enslaved, they were slaves from birth until death. And so the idea of flight to them is flying away to heaven where they're free, you know? So I try to put it in that context too, and also a spiritual context um, for my own, where I come from, uh, my, 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 my faith tradition too. But honestly, it came from me, me trying to just try to place myself. I like what you said, you know, you didn't live it, you know? Um, obviously, it's, it affects us, but like, so it's kind of even hard in our privilege to kind of put ourselves in that, and, 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 and that's how I associate flying and freedom, you know, and, to, to, um, and death, and, and, you, know, it, you know, to be totally free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna have one more performance, but before we do, I want you to tell us a little bit about how this song cycle works. So I know we start out with Rhiannon and a series of songs, and then we go into what I presume are some classical pieces. Could you tell us a little bit about how the makeup of the song cycle? Yeah, and Cici could just jump in when you, when you, whenever, <laughs> um, because it, it's, a, it's, a collabor it's a collaboration. Yeah. Oftentimes, the, comp the composer gets all the credit, <laughs> but it really, I, I mean, I, the words, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think, to be honest, are the most important part. Um, so, uh, so basically, um, there are, well, I start off with the spiritual that I reimagined a long time ago, that Rhiannon, that Rhiannon is gonna kind of usher, you know, um, it's a great transition piece from her set until I think the cycle. Um, yeah, because just to set that up, sure. the, I'm doing a few songs uh, as kind of to open it. Um, and there are my, my engagements with this sort of, uh, what, is, what do you call it? Ephemera, whatever, the, yeah. the, this sort of, <laughs> Um, historical mm -hmm. documents turning into art. It's, an, it's kind of a, a thing that I do. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've put a few of those together as, as sort of a, a, a preparatory, you know, sort of moment. And then it, 
then goes into. So it's yeah, just yeah no, no, thank you for that. And then so I, I decided to do a, a spiritual O Freedom, O Freedom over me. Before I was a slave, before I'd be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free, which will lead us into the uh, song cycle, which starts with this piece you just heard, um, Titi's journey into, in, into actually writing these things. Now, Titi um, also, um, uh, again, she also curated this and, and added um, two other poets. One uh, specializes in, in haiku, African-American haiku, and the other uh, poet, um, I, I'm not sure how you describe yeah. them. Oh, um, so thank you for, for bringing them. Yeah. Um, so Crystal Simone Smith is the one who um, uh, writes in haiku uh, sequences. And the haiku has a really important tradition in African-American poetry that we don't necessarily always think about. Um, Richard Wright spent the last uh, couple years of his life just writing haiku, haiku, haiku. Um, but, uh, and then uh, the other poet is Chihimba Jess, who um, uh, in his amazing Pulitzer Prize collection, um, Olio, mm -hmm. there are a number of sonnets um, that are to um, uh, Jubilee singers from the Fifth mm -hmm. Jubilees. Uh, it, there are many, many forms in there. But um, so uh, one of the things that Sean did was find an arc. I sent him some poems, and I was like, you know, I think these fit in a particular order, et cetera, et cetera. And he found um, a, an arc where several of the poems are personas that are in, um, in the database, mm -hmm. but there are also very powerful resonances between that historical material and the present yes. moment. Okay. So, uh, for example, um, I, I mean, I was writing in 2020. It, everybody was in that moment, and we still are, but it was a moment where you just couldn't not hear the resonances, mm -hmm. right? Um, and these were people running through the spaces that an Ahmad Arbery would have been running through, that we run through. I mean, I live in Durham, North Carolina. Um, you know, and um, so when I was looking, I decided to just see, well, is there McMichael, the, the family that shot um, Ahmad Arbery? And there truly is in that part of Georgia, in the database. And then it kind of writes itself. Whatever the words happen to be, mm -hmm. it writes the fact that we are still on this ground where there are no monuments. And if we are going to stay on this ground, mm -hmm. we have to do something. Mm -hmm. And the first thing we have to do is face it. You know? yeah. um, and so that's what having the database did. Um, and so what what the arc, I think, does is kind of move in between that, that space where the present is very, um, very much reflected in the past, these personas so that we get close to that material. There's a couple of sort of folk sounding songs. Um, one thinking about what was the relationship and um, interdependency, but also recognition between um, indigenous communities and Africans um, moving through um, uninhabitable space, right? Mm -hmm. Like the Dismal Swamp. Um, and those, um, some of what comes out of the traditions, for example, the blues singing of always being on the move, mm -hmm. right? That there's still, there are resonances there. Um, and then it, it sort of goes, out of that, and, and, and there are poems in there that look for pleasure, for joy, for mm -hmm. the, the closeness that you know that's there. If, a, if, if you're taking your own life into your own hands to run, if you decide to do that with the woman you love, right. you're risking a lot, right. and you care a lot. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, and then it kind of, we end, um, well, yeah, we end with that McMichael poem going into um, one of Chahimba Jess's, uh, his, his poem, uh, it's called Thomas Rutling, which was the name of one of the um, uh, Jubilee singers. And uh, Chahimba finds, where would the singer have heard this song for the first time? And it's from his mother. And 
there's so many family relationships that are just sort of gestured to in these mm -hmm. um, ads. And I think um, for the reason, I mean, I think it always resonates for everyone, but I, I happen to be in a stage of life where having a, a very young kid and parents who are, are um, suffering from mm -hmm. aging, <laughs> um, it, that stuff really resonates. And so one of the threads that I see, there's the fly away thread, there's also the thread of mothers. Mm -hmm. There really is. Mm -hmm. And where someone might have run to, it might be because their mother was in that period. Right. You know, like just right. to think about that, it's mm -hmm. just really, um, yeah, I mean, what, what was so fun, I, I mean, like this week is just like a miracle for somebody <laughs> who sits in a room, writes some words that really don't actually make sense to anybody but themselves, <laughs> you know, is like to find out the, the arc of this in hearing the songs. And, and that's, I think a composer composes, mm -hmm. you know, like gives structure and form and that it's not just on the level of the notes. There's, there's this arc that's there in what Sean has done with this that mm -hmm. I think is really exciting. And so. I think these, these are, it, it's such a, it's so big. Because we, we have no concept of, of what the everyday life was for these folks, right? right? And, and all we can do is use our art mm -hmm. and instincts and spiritual guidance to get to the center of it so that you all can feel it. Mm -hmm. And it's like we're all grasping for it together. But like, I feel like it's the only way there is through art, which mm -hmm. is why we're, you know, because you could say, why a song cycle? <laughs> you know, right. like, why y'all doing this? Well, <laughs> I, think, I, think that's, I think that's why. It's too big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's too big yeah. to do anything other than make a big art piece of art out of yeah. it. Well, then let's do it big one more time. We're going to bring out Will Liverman, Reginald Mobley will join them, and Karen Slack with Howard Watkins on piano. They will be performing Jack and Paul. And this is a poem by Crystal Simone Smith. Thank you.
Thank you, Karen Slack, Reginald Mobley, Will Liverman, and Howard Watkins. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to this panel. We are running out of time. We could have had a whole other conversation about poetry and its mechanisms in this song cycle. But for those of you who have tickets, you're in for a treat. This was only a taste. For those of you who don't, there are other performances in other states. So, you know, if you have mobility and flight, <laughs> flight. <laughs> flight you know, Just a short do that. Yeah. Uh, sure, yeah, it flight. may find itself online as well. But thank you so much, Sean and Rihanna and Rhiannon and Titsy and Edward and Reginald again. again. And Martha and Erica, who are in the room, please wave your hands. Thank you for bringing this collaboration together. There are many other programs happening at the Schomburg. This is the first of our season, so please visit our website at schomburg.org for more that is coming up. Otherwise, have a safe and wonderful night, and we'll see you again here soon. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, Martha and Erica, if you could come up this way, please. Thank you. Oh, we can take it off, yeah.